Happy Sabbath morning to everyone here from Centerville, Ohio. About two minutes ago, the sun broke through. It's bright. It was kind of clouded when I did the lesson study. So it's shining through here, and that sun kind of tells us about God's love. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we see through the sun, we see through the wonderful acts of nature that your love and care for us is here. Even during this time of pandemic, you are here. Your hand is here to protect all of us. And as we open up your word and read about how you dealt with many more crises, much greater than this through history, we can take comfort in that because you do not change. And the promise that you made back at the Last Supper, that you will come again, we believe on it and we look forward to your soon coming in the clouds of heaven to take us all home. Until that is, Continue to allow the gift of the Holy Spirit to work within us individually and collectively to do your will here on this fallen planet. In all these things we pray in Jesus' name, amen. In the fifth grade, uh, I attended New Albany Elementary School. New Albany at that time was a little country school uh, about 15 miles northeast of Columbus, Ohio. Uh, today, it is where multimillionaires live. If you've heard of Les Wexner of the Limited, he basically owns most of that. But back when I was in the fifth grade, it was kind of on the edge of the country. We lived on Alry Road, and you had maybe seven houses on the one side of the road. And we were the third house, and the seventh house was where my aunt and uncle, my aunt Opal and uncle Darris, with my cousin Tina lived. And both Tina and I, of course, we were the same age, we were in the fifth grade, and we were in the same class. And that year we had a new teacher in science. Uh, basically, at least grades one through four, you had one teacher the whole time. When you got into the fifth grade, you would have different teachers for certain subjects. And so while my home teacher might have been Mrs. Stevens, we would go to other classes to learn other subjects. And in science, there was a new man. His name was Mr. McQuinney. He looked like a giant. He was probably about six foot three. He had a crew cut, uh, looked like he just came out of the Marines. And he was a teacher none of us had dealt with before. He had high standards and you were going to meet them or you were not going to do well in his class. And so about a month in, he gave his first test. And man, it was a shock to most of the class. And I remember him, he went to the blackboard and he kind of wrote down, kind of, this was here, here's the F, D, C, B, and A. Over half the class flunked. Uh, some got a D. Some of us, and I was in this category, I had a C plus, I had a 77. A couple had a B, and I think my cousin Tina and the smartest guy in the class named Stan Hatfield, they, they had A's. And so it was a shock, and, and Mr. McQuinney said, I'll tell you what, we're going to do a makeup next week. And so I highly encourage you to study, to bring your grades up, because he said, I'll take the highest grade, and that will be your grade for that midterm or first test. So when I came back and showed my parents I'd got a 77, and that my cousin Tina had got a 93, there was a decision made. I was to go every Saturday morning, the five houses down, to Aunt Opal, who was like a drill sergeant. We would sit at the table and she would basically drill us with all the material. And it probably went from about 9 a.m. to about 2 or 3 p.m. And I remember that. I wasn't really thrilled about it, but as they said, you got the C+, we're sending you to Aunt Opal. And so I remember going there, and I was, I was scared of Aunt Opal, though she never, she, I don't think she hardly ever yelled at me or, 
or did any physical thing to me. Uh, and I learned. I kept my trap shut and I learned. They took the test. Now remember, my cousin Tina had got a 93. Okay. Mr. McQuinney comes to the board again. And this time the F's had probably dropped by 80%. You could say those who got the F's were usually the people that got F's and D's anyway. And then the D's dropped. And those who had D's went up into the C's. And some who had the C's went into the B's. And then I remember him saying, and now here are the honors. And he said, Freddie, come on up. And so the whole class applauded. I had went to a 92, and they all applauded me. I think myself and another person had maybe jumped from a C to an A or an A minus. Tina went from a 93 to a 94. She didn't get any applause. And I know uh, that was something she just kind of shook her head about. And of course, I was now Aunt Opal's prized student because she can say I took Freddie from a C plus to an AA minus. And so I got all the glory and cause of the second chance that Mr. McQuinney had given us. And for the rest of that year, every Saturday, because I wasn't raised a Seventh-day Adventist, I would have to truck down to be at the, at the kitchen table with my Aunt Opal and my cousin Tina to go over the science. But I had ha I'd gotten a second chance. We serve a God who is the God of second chances. And so, if you'll turn to me to the story of when Jesus went out to the Lake of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, and began preaching in a boat. And these fishermen, many of them who probably knew who he was, are going to get a commission and a command. Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. Now it happened that while the crowd was pressing around him, listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, which is Galilee. And he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little way from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. Uh, your version also in verse 3 might say, he asked them to go into deep water. Go out into deep water. Do it again. Verse 4. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Now, Jesus knew Peter. We know this because in the previous chapter, I believe verse 38 and 39, Jesus had healed Peter's mother-in-law of a fever on the Sabbath there in Capernaum. And so he knew them. He probably knew Andrew, because remember it was Andrew that brought Peter to Christ. And then you have the sons of Zebedee, James and John, also on that boat. So Jesus says to them, go out into deep water. Try it again. Now they had fished all night, had caught nothing, but to cast out into the deep water. And so as we find out in verses 5 through 7, Simon answered and said, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing. But I will do as you say and let down the nets. When they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish and their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats. So they began to sank. So there's so much fish the nets are beginning to break. They put them on the two boats, and the boats are beginning to sink. Now, these are guys who had been out all night. These are experienced fishermen, had caught nothing. And the teacher, the healer, clearly they knew who Jesus was. 
They had seen him heal Peter's mother-in-law, and now they had followed him, followed his command. And now Jesus is going to tell them something that is going to affect the rest of their lives. Because easily, they could have said, thank you, Master and Teacher. We filled up our boat probably for weeks and weeks of fishing. We can pay off our bills, our debts, and that, thank you so much. And Jesus could have left, and it could have been a good fish story. But this is more than a fish story. So, they come back, the boats are beginning to sink. Remember, Jesus had asked Peter to go back out into the deep water. Verse 8, But when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For amazement had seized him and all of his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. And also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not fear. From now on, you won't be catching fish. You'll be catching men. You will be fishers of men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they had left everything, and they followed him. Peter's reaction is the reaction many of us when we know we are in the presence of someone special. Peter knew this man was a great healer. He knew he was a great teacher. And now he had produced nets full of fish, so much it was sinking both boats of his little company that he had with his brother Andrew and James and John. And he steps back. He is amazed. And he says, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Isaiah did the same thing in his vision. When the angels came down and said, holy, 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 Isaiah said, I am a man of unclean lips. I belong to an unclean people. When you're in the presence of the divine, you realize your true unworthiness. And we don't quite know everything that Peter was thinking at this time, but we do know him and the others on that boat left their livelihood and followed this man, this great teacher, this great healer. He's basically saying, you used to catch fish, you will now be catching human beings alive. And in the manner of a fisherman, Peter will gather in human beings for God's kingdom. So Peter, along with Andrew, James, and John, were called to ministry. Peter is the one Jesus asked. So now we go to a second time, dealing with a stranger on the shore. The first story, Jesus was standing on the edge of the Sea of Galilee. And now... As we would say, there's been a lot of water under the bridge. It's been three and a half years later. It's the post-resurrection. He has already revealed himself to the eleven. Uh, the Gospel of John, the Doubting Thomas story. And they are again back out on the Sea of Galilee, not having hardly any luck. So if you will turn with me to John 21, verses 4 through 6. Now remember, they're out again on the Sea of Galilee. Simon, Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel of Cana, the sons of Zebedee, who would be James and John, and two others of his disciples together. So you have seven of them out there fishing. Verses 4 through 6. But when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. He was a stranger on the shore. So Jesus said to them, Children, do you not have any fish, do you? They answered him, No. Again, a repeat somewhat of the story from when they were first called to ministry. Verse 6, And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find a catch. So they cast and then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. Again, 
they had completed an unsuccessful night of fishing. The stranger, who they don't quite recognize, beckons them from the beach, say, hey, put it on the right side. And they catch so much fish, they can't even bring it into the boat. Then John begins to see who this man is. Verses 7 and 8. Therefore the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. Imagine that. It is the Lord. So when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put his outer garment on, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, but about 100 yards away, dragging the net full of fish, which is 153 fish. And there they see Jesus preparing breakfast for them. Verses 9. So when they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid and fish placed on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have now caught. Simon Peter went up, drew the net to land, full of large fish, a hundred and fifty-three, and although there were so many, the net was, on, was not torn. So unlike, unlike three and a half years before, the nets were not torn and the boats did not sink. But it was so heavy, they had to drag it to shore. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples wanted to question him. Who are you knowing that it was the Lord, that it was him? The theologian F.F. F. Bruce states that the disciples' haul of fish is a parable of their missionary activity in the time that lies ahead. Basically, Jesus is saying, you were able to catch men when I was with you. You're going to continue to do that even more greater than you did when I was among you because I'm going to send the helper to you the Holy Spirit. So while they're out fishing during the 40 days that Jesus was alive between his resurrection and his ascension, Jesus is saying to them, I'm going to still be with you. You still have a task to do and a mission, and I will give you power on on high. But the key point of the story is he has to rehabilitate Peter. He needs to give him a second chance. He needs to recall and recommission Peter in front of the others. And so we come to verse 15. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus, he beckons to Simon Peter, and he takes him aside. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to them, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my lambs. Now, why does he ask that question? Do you love me more than these? We need to remember Peter's earlier boast in Matthew 26, 33, where he said, Even though all may fall away because of you, I will never fall away. So now Jesus asked him, Do you love me more than these others? Well, how could Peter know how much the others loved their common Lord? Of course, he could not know. But once before, he thought he did know and reckoned that his love could outdo theirs. Whatever my others may do, I will lay down my life for you. And so I'm sure Jesus is saying that to him. And he remembers that night, not that long ago, when he boasted that others will fail. Others will fall away from you, but not me. I will lay down my life for you. Verses 16 and 17. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to them, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. Again, he's recommissioning him and he's making him the leader once again. He said to him the third time. Remember, he had denied him three times. Probably each time Jesus says this, it pricks Peter's heart. It makes him feel his unworthiness, his need for forgiveness. 
He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Desire of Ages says Peter's denial of his Lord had been in shameful contrast to his former professions of loyalty. He had dishonored Christ and had incurred the distrust of his brethren. They thought he would not be allowed to take his former position among them, and he himself felt that he had forfeited his trust. Before being called to take up again his apostolic work, he must before them all give evidence of his repentance. Without this, his sin, though repented of, might have destroyed his influence as a minister of Christ. The Savior gave him opportunity to regain the confidence of his brethren, and so far as possible, to remove the reproach he had brought upon the gospel. And so, Jesus as a friend, rehabilitating Peter, they probably can't hear what he's saying, but I'm sure Jesus maybe has his arm around him. Jesus is saying to all of them, he's still my guy. He's still the person I came to three and a half years before. And I went to him and I said, go out into deep water. And then the others followed. Peter reaffirms three times his love for the Lord and he is rehabilitated and recommissioned. And then the, toward the end of the story, verses 18 and 19, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and will bring you where you do not wish to go. Now this he said, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me, follow me. William Barclay writes this, Love brought Peter a task, and it brought him a cross. Jesus says in Mark 8, 34, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. And it's ironic that Peter's previous boast at the Last Supper will yet be fulfilled when he says in John 13, 37, boasting, I will lay down my life for you. And of course he did. 10 out of the 11 died a martyr's death and John was persecuted and died on a prison colony on the island of Patmos. The God of second chances, the God who rehabilitated Peter, the great Peter, the post, the post resurrection, Pentecost Peter. We would not have known that if Jesus didn't put his arm around him. The stranger put his arm around him on that beach in front of seven of the eleven and publicly rehabilitated him. To follow him, to follow him, means to care about those in the world as much as he did through our preaching, our teaching, and our ministries. To be a true disciple of Christ means, yes, even here at this time, this time of pandemic, in fact, we could say even more in this time, we must deny ourselves, take up our crosses, and follow him. But that we do not have to be fearful, but to have courage as Christ has already overcome the world and as he makes the promise in Matthew 28, 20, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. The God of second chances bids us to follow him, to take up our cross, and to do his work, because he's coming soon. I want to uh, introduce you to the rest of the family. 
Well, everybody's been wondering where Clyde is. He's alive and well. He's just being a true cat. He, I posted uh, pictures, but uh, he's been trying to get outside to chase birds and bunnies and squirrels and stuff. So he wanted a day off. So that's what he had. So, uh, but we are well. We wanted to wish everyone a happy Sabbath. We wanted to let you know how much we truly miss you. Mm -hmm. We miss seeing you each week in person. And we're hoping that we can get back and have in-person meetings um, very soon mm -hmm. in our churches. Um, I will tell you that uh, we've been communicating with our conference leadership and a document is being uh, shared with pastors on Monday. We're trying to outline different things on, you know, making sure that we have some best practices in place, some uh, good things to uh, have it ready for once we are able to get back into our buildings. And as soon as those things are available, uh, we're going to be sharing those. Um, obviously, through my communications had at the conference, but also to our church families. So mm -hmm. we want to thank you for your patience, for yes. your understanding. Mm -hmm. uh, we just want to be uh, safe for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, that's what everyone is, is trying to do. And the, the, you know, we understand that we have a, a variety of different people in our congregations, not just in our churches, mm -hmm. but statewide. Yes. So uh, uh, we just want to thank you so much for your patience and let you know that we are, we too are ready to yes. get back Amen. into our, our buildings. Amen. But uh, we hope that you have a wonderful, blessed week. We've been able to, to connect with a lot of you. And uh, we mm -hmm. invite you that if you want to join our prayer calls on, on the uh, mornings at 7 a.m., you can. We've got lots of different things going on. We've got Zoom Bible studies. We've got phone Bible studies. And if you have ideas for things that we haven't been able to do, let us know because we want to remain connected with you, um, not just virtually in person, but we want to look at some other things that we can do too. So we're always um, open for suggestions, I think. Thank you, Heidi. Okay, yes, he said, let's have closing prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, you are the God of second chances. You are the God that not only rehabilitates Peter, but re rehabilitates all of us by your shed blood on the cross. May the power of it be within our lives as we go forward during this time, not in fear, but in courage, having you by our side. In all these things we pray in Jesus' name, amen. May you have a rest of a wonderful Sabbath day. God bless you. God bless you. We'll see you next week.